If you love French history and antique roses, this place should be at the top of your bucket list for a visit to Paris. Today we're visiting one of the only places we would go back to more than once. This is the gorgeous Chateau Malmaison, the private home of Napoleon and his wife Josephine. This gorgeous estate was purchased in sort of a rundown state by Josephine on April 21st of 1799 while Napoleon was on campaign in Egypt. She purchased it for the sum of around 325,000 francs, sort of borrowing from the money that she expected him to come home from Egypt with. He was said to be displeased with her for this purchase, but it did become their favorite home. Josephine spent a fortune renovating the property and adding to it. It was to become her beloved private home and gardens where she spent most of her time and indeed her last days as well. She decorated it to her taste and she indulged herself by collecting and importing roses and rare and exotic plants and even animals from all over the globe. Her collection eventually included some 250 roses and the art prints that she commissioned by the famous artist Redoute of her roses and irises still sell well to this day. She was responsible for cultivating around 200 new plants previously unknown to France. She built an orangerie for some 300 pineapple plants, a greenhouse heated by 12 coal burning stoves, and the exotic animals and birds that roamed the property included at one time kangaroos, llamas, zebras, an ostrich, a seal, and many other fantastical creatures. I first heard of Malmaison back in the early 2000s when I became obsessed with growing antique roses here at our property, and many of the most famous varieties that you want to grow if you love antique roses will trace back to Josephine's garden since it contained nearly every rose known to exist at her time. She had plants shipped from all over the globe as Napoleon's boats and armies moved around, and her shipments were said to have been so important that a ship carrying plants for Josephine's gardens would be allowed through any navy blockades, although you can't help wondering if they were maybe smuggling other things through under her diplomatic immunity. As a side note, I always find it interesting, the name Malmaison, so I looked it up, and it was first referred to in 1244, it's, it stands for Evil House, translated in French, and it was thought to be a reference to a hideout used by Norman invaders to carry out raids on surrounding areas. There was also a manor house called La Malmaison here referred to in the 1300s, so the name goes way back. A walk through this mansion is amazing. The interior is gorgeous. It is much as it was in their time. A lot of the furnishings are original. This was their private retreat, and they spent much of their time here, if you can call it, you know, their off time, but they spent a lot of their private time here, although Napoleon did much of his work from the study here, as it was one of his two main seats of power between 1800 and 1802, so very many meetings and receptions and concerts and balls took place here, but you'll find that Malmaison definitely does feel, although it is a large mansion and, or a small chateau, it does have a feel to it. It feels like it could be a home. There is definitely a home feel to this place. And if you walk around the gardens and grounds, you'll see markers in the ground. There is a path that's marked as Napoleon and Josephine's path or walk. And it's uh, legend says that this is the route that they would take when they walked and talked privately together in their time here. The original 148 acre property that she bought was expanded throughout her lifetime. By the time Josephine died, she owned 1,794 acres. It has been much reduced since then. Her menagerie has long since disappeared, of course. By 1896, the estate had been reduced to around 16 acres that is here now, which is a, a sad reduction of what was once probably an amazing place. It's so historic, but we were actually surprised to find that Malmaison is not very well known or remembered, sadly. When we were here, we actually talked to two different local, you know, native Parisians, and we were tourists, so of course they asked us, you know, where are you going today, what are you going to see? And we said, we're going out to Malmaison, and both of them looked at us like, where? I couldn't believe they they both had never heard of it. They had no idea what it was or where it was. I, mean, I couldn't believe they had never heard of this. So unfortunately, it's not as well known as it should be. And if you're like me and you love to read, I would highly recommend finding a copy of the memoirs of Queen Hortense, who was Josephine's daughter from her prior marriage. She had two children from her first husband, who was guillotined during the revolution. Eugène and Hortense were her children who became part of the new imperial family. And Hortense was eventually married to Napoleon's brother, Louis. They became the king and queen of Holland. She had a miserable marriage to him, which is a whole story in itself. But she wrote this incredible memoir throughout her life and her later life, and it is a wonderful first-hand sort of eyewitness insider account 
of Napoleon from the viewpoint of his stepdaughter, it is well worth a read. I especially loved her firsthand account of their divorce, the story of Napoleon's hard decision to finally divorce Josephine after 15 years of happy marriage in order to be able to possibly have a son by a second younger wife. She tells it with the unique insider's point of view, and tragically, his decision was somewhat precipitated by the death of Hortense's own young son, who was Napoleon's designated heir in 1807. So the idea of a divorce was floated for a couple of years. It wasn't really a surprise, but she does recount the story of her mother actually fainting when Napoleon finally told her his decision was final, and that he and another man had to carry Josephine to her room to recover. Josephine left the Tuileries for her beloved Malmaison in a carriage with Hortense in the pouring rain in the afternoon of December 16, 1809, and her daughter recounts, Our trip to Malmaison was a sad and silent one. When my mother entered that house where she had been so happy, her heart was heavy with grief. She said, If he is happy, I shall not regret what I have done. But Hortense continued, quote, As she spoke to me, her eyes constantly filled with tears. The next day, the emperor actually did come out to visit Josephine at Malmaison, and they walked hand in hand for hours through the garden talking. I did learn that the carriage they rode out to Malmaison and on that journey remains at the Malmaison Museum, although we didn't go and see it. So if we go back out, I am definitely going to go and see if we can find the carriage. Josephine spent the rest of her life mostly at Malmaison. She was given the estate plus a 5 million franc allowance annually, and she kept the title of empress. Her children and grandchildren, and of course even Napoleon, visited her here. According to Hortense's account of the story, Napoleon was actually very emotional about having to divorce Josephine, and he begged Hortense and Eugène not to desert him at his time of greatest despair, and insisted that they remain close to him. After Napoleon's abdication and exile to Elba, an unusual guest actually became a close family friend to Hortense and her mother. This was the Emperor Alexander I of Russia, he spent as much time as possible actually privately visiting Hortense and Josephine, and he said he preferred their homes to the royal protocol he faced at all the state visits in Paris. He told Hortense that she felt like someone he'd always known, and that being at her home felt like being in his own. Unfortunately, Hortense recounts that after Napoleon's second exile, Alexander turned on the family, refused to see them, and treated them so harshly that she was forced to return his letters and said that she had been mistaken in assuming his friendship. Josephine's final illness actually developed after she took a walk with Emperor Alexander on the grounds of Queen Hortense's property outside of Paris on May 14th of 1814. She returned to Malmaison and wasn't feeling well. Her illness developed from a cold to a cough, which alarmed her children enough that they were both at Malmaison, and Alexander himself actually sent his own physician to see Josephine. Alexander arrived May 28th for a pre-planned dinner party, which they actually hid from Josephine the fact that he was there. They didn't want her to disturb herself and get out of her sickbed to entertain Alexander, so they told her he had not come. He left that night, and Josephine died the next day on May 29th of 1814 at the age of 50 in the red and gilt tent-shaped bed that you can still see in her rooms today. Her son Eugène inherited Malmaison after Josephine's death, but his widow sold it in 1828. It was then sold back into the family when Hortense's son Napoleon III bought it in 1861. After Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo and his abdication, he actually came out to Malmaison briefly, and he had Hortense and some of his family members actually joined him there, and she recounts walking through the gardens with him and having him mention that he could not get used to being at Malmaison without Josephine and that he expected to see her around any corner picking the flowers that she loved so much. He told Hortense how beautiful Malmaison was and how he wished they could just stay there, but he did make plans to leave from there and settle in America with his family. Napoleon sent Hortense back to Paris and he left Malmaison for the last time on June 29th of 1815. She recounts in her memoir walking down the gallery as she was leaving for Paris and realizing that she hadn't made provision to save the art and any of the pieces that were in Malmaison itself for her children and realizing that she would probably never get to preserve these artifacts for her family. By October of 1815, Napoleon had been exiled by the English to the island of St. Helena, where he died May 5th of 1821. His last words were said to be, France, Armée, head of Armée, Josephine. Hortense died in 1837 and was laid to rest next to her mother at the nearby Saint-Pierre-Saint-Paul Chapel. 
after their time at Malmaison was ransacked and vandalized, and the gardens were later destroyed in a battle in 1870. The property was restored to its current state by a famous French architect in the early 20th century and is now a historical monument and one well worth taking the time to see. If you're planning a visit out to Malmaison from Paris, plan to see it when the roses are at their peak. We were here on June 1st and they were just at their peak or maybe just slightly passing their peak, so it was a really perfect time to walk through the gardens. It takes, I believe, about an hour to get out there the way we went, which was by Metro to La Défense and then we got on a bus out to the chateau. If you decide to take the bus out, we did not know this, but probably everyone does but us, you need to know the route that you're taking and what stop is before your stop so you can tell the bus to stop and let you off. And we've kind of learned that the hard way. So keep that in mind. Also, if you take a bus, you will be getting off up at the top of the hill and it is quite a little long walk down to the chateau and then back up. So you'll have some walking. Um, the next time we go, we'll probably just take a taxi right to the gate. One other thing to notice, obviously check on closure times because some days it's not open and there is no food or water to buy on site. There is, um, I believe you can picnic here, but there is no, there's nothing you can buy. There's no cafe. So plan to bring any food or drink that you want with you. We learned that when we were there as well. Malmaison is so worth the trip. Plan to spend maybe half a day walking around the mansion and the beautiful grounds here, soaking up the atmosphere at this historic place where so much life was lived by these legendary people. Let us know in the comments if you've ever been out to this hidden historical treasure of Paris. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.